Well, everyone, it is that time of year again when in your Bible reading plans we start to get into the laws of Leviticus and the demands of, of Deuteronomy and our eyes start to glaze over. We've got a long way to go yet. We can't possibly imagine as modern, sophisticated people why we'd have any reason to read about how to treat festering scabs or what colors a priest should wear on his robe when officiating. And we can't imagine why we'd need to know why it's inappropriate to cook goat meat for supper sometimes. But at the end of the day, we can understand that these things, these laws that we read about, are are bound to ancient Israel's religious context, even if we don't understand them. We can get maybe why they might have been interesting or important to a people that have long since died. But what are we supposed to do when we get to uh, a nice, smooth narrative like this? And we read it, and we have these curveballs thrown at us where the Lord seemingly changes His mind about Moses and picks Aaron instead. Or where, for some unknown reason, the Lord seems to suddenly lose His temper with Moses and gets ready to kill him right after commissioning him, only to be satiated when his wife, his pagan wife of all people, circumcises their son and throws the remnant at his feet and declares Moses to be her bloody valentine. What are we to make of all that? The word bizarre barely begins to cover it, I think. It's so difficult to make sense of, and yet as Christians, we believe in our heart of hearts that this is Holy Scripture, inspired by the breath of God Himself What's an evangelical Bible reader to do when we don't understand what we're reading? But we're in good company this morning when we come to the Word with question marks floating over our heads. Because good theologians, every good theologian in fact, from Maximus the Confessor in the 6th century to Karl Barth in the 20th, would have us know that the confounding parts of the Bible are the ones that invite us into a deeper contemplation of who God is for us. When we can't understand, when we can't wrap our mind around what we're reading, that's an invitation from God Himself to consider who He is on a deeper level than we previously thought possible. Bart explicitly states that the more difficult parts of Scripture have more important things to say to us than our own theological musings could ever say. It's here when humility before an infinite and inscrutable God would serve us very, very well. And I think this passage is kind of an ideal illustration of that very principle for us. Because we see Moses, and he has a lot of doubt and skepticism about the God he is encountering. And this leads him to a kind of confusion, kind of mumbling, where we find Moses not only telling God that he has a speech impediment, that his tongue is slow and sluggish, a literal kind of mumbling, but we hear kind of a spiritual mumbling under his breath, doubting God is who he says he is, and doubting that God will do what he says he'll do. And so the Lord in his great kindness shows Moses the kind of miracles that He's capable of, and therefore the kind of God He is. All to inspire in Him faith that God really is the great I Am. But before we dive into Moses' mumbles and the Lord's miracles, let's review where we've been. Now last week, we were in Exodus 3 where God, who is, by the way, the protagonist of the story, the main and central character, reveals Himself in glory and in name. What is His name? Moses asks. And the answer, the answer is mysterious as it is powerful. God says, I am who I am. Otherwise rendered as, I will be who I will be. Our Bible captures this theological Reality and the all capitalized letters, capital L O R D, Lord. 
and against our instincts. We see here and over the course of the rest of the Scriptures that this means that God always does what God does. He always loves, rescues, forgives, and restores consistently according to His own character, to His own name. When humanity is weak and cowardly and violent and even downright evil, nevertheless, God is who God is. God will do what God will do. And so when we pick up in our passage today, we're still in the middle of God's surprising and somewhat scary appearance in the story. Here he is at the peak of a mountain, a voice disembodied in a burning bush that is not consumed. And he's speaking to Moses of all people, the poster boy of outcasts. Moses himself is in such a state of shock over this that he keeps asking questions of the Lord, keeps putting up resistance to Him. Now, he seems genuinely baffled, I think, that the Lord would reveal Himself to him. And so, last week, we heard him ask, I think, two reasonable questions. First of all, he asked uh, and expressed his own sense of inadequacy to God's task and God's person. That's a fair a self-assessment, I think. And secondly, he asked who exactly this God is. He asked a question about God's name and therefore God's character. And in both cases, the Lord responds out of His own character. Just, holy, yet compassionate and gracious. But now Moses has three objections in tow. You know, he kind of reminds me of Abraham in a certain way. You remember that story in, I think, Genesis 19? I want to say it is. Genesis 18 or 19. Abraham repeatedly asked God, how few righteous people have to be in Sodom to keep the Lord from destroying it? They'll say, now, don't get mad at me for this next question. But how about 15? Now, per adventure, Lord, that's what I like the way the KJV says. Per adventure, there's only 10 people there. He keeps going and going, asking God about his patience. Or we might be reminded of Gideon. You remember uh, Gideon when the Lord appears to him and tells him that he is going to fight for an oppressed Israel. How Gideon keeps asking for repeated signs. All right, I'm going to put out the, the, the fleece. Let there be dew only on the fleece, and then everywhere else is dry, and then I'll know. And then God does that, and he says, okay, well, let's reverse it this time. We'll do everywhere else, but not on the fleece. It just keeps going and going. We see Moses kind of have the same attitude here. And in all of these stories, one thing and common theme emerges. God's promises of protection and provision just seem to be too, seem to be, uh, too good to be true to doubting people like us to sinful people like us. God couldn't possibly be the kind of God He says He is. So Moses, like Abraham or Gideon, or like any of us, I'm sure, continues to question, unable to believe what he's seeing or what he's hearing. The Lord knows who Moses is, maybe. And He reveals who He Himself is also. But Moses says, do you really know the Israelites though? So he asked him in verse 1, what if they don't believe me? After all, I was one of them. And 40 years ago, they didn't believe me either. Christopher J.H. Wright, the Old Testament theologian, notes how Moses' question in Hebrew is not even a question really. It's more of a statement. In fact, we could render this passage as saying, uh, Lord, they won't listen to me. And they won't obey. They won't believe that you appeared. They won't believe that you sent me. And you know what? Moses isn't totally incorrect in his assessment of Israel. Israel wouldn't easily believe or listen to God. And over the course of their history, we see how true that is. Time and time again, they disbelieve. Time and time again, they disobey. And 
Yet God keeps saying these words, believe and listen, multiple times over these next nine verses. Their faith and obedience are much like ours. Wavering. Faltering. And sometimes outright non-existent. But God's response to such hard-hearted people is kind of amazing. He doesn't lash out at Moses and say, don't contradict me, mortal. He simply shows him, yet again, the kind of God He is. A patient one. By showing three miraculous signs. Things that only God Himself could do. That Moses couldn't come in His own power and perform. And what are these, these, these three miracles? Well, first, we see about God ask, asking about the staff in Moses' hand. What is that in your hand? He knows. What is that in your hand? Moses says, well, it's a, it's a shepherding staff. He says, well, toss it in the dust. And the second that staff hits the sand, it becomes a snake, causing Moses, and I think anybody in their right mind, to scream and run away. But the Lord says, reach out. Grasp it hard with your hand. And Moses, the second he grips the snake's tail, never really a wise move, I don't think. Lo and behold, it's a simple shepherding staff again. Now why is this? Because as we'll see later, in later chapters, I should say, the Egyptian magicians and their snake cults were able to conjure up similar tricks. No doubt they are empowered in, in some spiritual way by their dark demon lords. But these snake symbols are, are, are not um, incidental. It figured predominantly into Egyptian culture. And we still see it carry over in our culture where you might see a staff with snakes coiled around it. And what does that symbolize to us? It symbolizes medical treatment. symbolizes healing. Ironically, the snake was a symbol of healing in the ancient world. And so what God is showing Moses, and soon the ancestors of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, is that it is God who wields not only ultimate power over every living thing that crawls or slithers in this world, but that He is the God who alone has the power to heal. Which brings us to our next sign. So there's that sign. If, if Moses does that, maybe they'll believe. What if they don't? What if they're hard of heart? And boy, do we find out how hard of heart they really are. But God says, perform the second miracle then. He tells Moses to, to hide his hand in his cloak in verse 6. And then remove it. And when Moses removes it, he finds that his hand is covered in a scaly white skin. Now Moses looks like a snake. But much to his relief. And you think, my goodness, if you think it's scary to have a little serpent crawling around, imagine pulling a leprous hand out of your coat. For much to Moses' relief, the Lord says, alright, now put it back in your cloak and remove it. And he found it was restored to normal. If they won't believe you or listen to me, God says, maybe this will convince them that I am who I am and what I want to accomplish for them. Even the healing of their diseases. Their deliverance from every enemy. But God knows Israel well, whether Moses realizes it or not. And he says, if, if those two things don't work, then maybe there's a third sign. Now this sign is too powerful, too mighty, too terrifying to be having a test run out here in the desert. But the Lord says, if these two miracles don't convince them, take water from the Nile, the source of Egypt's life and culture and economy, and also will recall the sight of death for many young Hebrew boys. Take some of that water from the Nile, pour it on the ground, and watch it turn to blood. 
God seems to be saying, while you show them, while you show the Israelites that I will heal them and they will be my people, you'll also be showing the Egyptians that I will curse them if they resist me and my son. This functions as a double-edged sword. While the Hebrews get to see that God is capable of healing them, they'll also be able to see that God is able to destroy anybody who resists Him. So, based on these three miracles, Moses should be ready to go then, right? He's seen everything he's needed to see. Well, is he ready to go? Hardly. We're not even halfway there yet. After all this, Moses blushes and tries to think of some excuse. And he says, please, Lord, I'm not a, I, I'm not a public speaker. My tongue is sluggish. I'm a stutterer. I'm a mumbler. Now, some people think that this means that, oh, well, he's been in the wilderness for a long time. He's no doubt not speaking Hebrew with the Midianites out in the, out in the, uh, the wilderness of the Arabian desert. So maybe his, his Hebrew is rusty. Maybe his Egyptian, his Coptic is rusty. So when he goes back, he'll be slow of tongue. Maybe. But there's also a sense in which maybe what he's saying here is, I literally can't speak well. I, I don't, I'm, I, I just can't enunciate my words when I need to. Maybe he's like the Apostle Paul in that sense. Regardless of however we interpret that, perhaps that excuse of I'm not a good orator, my rhetoric is not sharp, would work on people. But Moses seems to forget who he's speaking to here. The God, the, the, the voice that can speak through a burning bush. The God that can show that He can create anything and do anything. Change life from death and death to life. This Lord says, who do you think formed your mouth in the first place? Who do you think breathed life and a soul into human beings? Image bearers of God, Moses. Who do you think you're speaking to other than anybody else than the divine speaker himself? Moses' excuse holds no water here. The Lord, it is the Lord, we read. Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Now go. Because it's not about what you can say, Moses. It's not about what you can do. Have you not been paying attention? I will be the one speaking through and for you. Again, we see the Lord's character come through here. As the God who creates, but as the God who also uplifts and empowers in order to give life and liberty to all who believe. So the Lord simply says to Moses, go. You've seen everything you've needed to see. Go. But in verse 13, Moses says, please, please, for the love of you, Send someone else. Send anybody else. Wrong thing to say, Moses. You had a list of things you could have responded with, and this was the last one you should have said. Because we read, the Lord's anger burns against Moses. This is actually the first time, believe it or not, that in the entirety of the Bible, it says that God becomes angry it's the first time we don't read that with Adam and Eve. We don't read it with Cain and Abel. We don't read it with Noah and the flood. We don't read it with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. With Moses, God becomes angry. His snout becomes short. His, 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 his nostrils flare. Heat, fire comes spewing out of them. And I imagine the heat from that burning bush starts to radiate hotter and brighter. 
after all that God has said, after all He's revealed, after all He's done, Moses still doesn't want to listen and obey. Forget the Israelites. Forget Pharaoh. Moses, who's seen it with his own eyes, who's heard it with his own ears, who's perceived it with his whole being, doesn't want to listen or obey to the God who's made Himself more than clear. And the God who's shown, I'm on your side, Moses. He'd rather mumble and doubt. He'd rather disbelieve and disobey rather than to see and hear and know what is so patently obvious. That the Lord is who He is and He will do what He will do. And that he is for Moses and the Israelites. Not Moses, nor Pharaoh. Not Egypt, nor Israel. Not America, nor Russia, nor China. Not Biden, nor Trump. Not the free market, or celebrity culture, or a novel pandemic, or social media, or climate change, or violent revolution, nor anything or anyone else will ever stop the Lord from doing what the Lord will do. His agenda for human beings is simple. Turn from your regimes of sin and death. Repent unto light and life. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, who live in the wilderness as exiles and murderers and thieves and adulterers, who are rejected and dejected, who are broke, busted, and disgusted. Because I alone will give you rest. I, the God who sees, the God who hears, the God who knows all. Who knows you and your sluggish tongue and your feeble fingers and your weak and unloving heart. Who knows you and yet loves you all the same. And while God has every right to let Moses feel his righteous burn here, like he does with any of us, instead, Moses finds that God is also one who is slow to anger. He's compassionate and gracious. Because while he's angry with Moses, notice he doesn't even say a harsh word towards him. He's angry with sin. He's angry with death. And yet, he loves sinners. He comes to rescue them from the self-imposed shackles of death that they wrap around their wrists and around their heart. He says, don't you have a brother, Aaron the Levite? Well, he speaks well. He's respected by the community. He knows what it's like to live under the brutal reign of an unjust Pharaoh. He'll be by, he'll be by your side. He'll speak for you wherever you go, Moses. And in fact, here's the surprising part. He says he's already on the way to meet you. Isn't that interesting? That before Moses ever has a chance to say no, God knows what's in Moses' heart. And he's already making plans to help Moses who won't even help himself. By some strange ordering of providence, Aaron was on the road to Moses before Moses had a chance to say no to God. Even when Moses is about to reject God outright, God has already sovereignly called Aaron up from the dugout to pinch hit for him. And that's the kind of God He is. 
the God who reunites and reconciles families unto Him and themselves. Because not only is Aaron going out to begrudgingly be with Moses, in fact, there's joy in his heart. His 83-year-old brother will be like a joyful little boy when he sees Moses again. That cute little baby brother that was once in that basket, now an old and grayed and hobbled man. There will be joy that the Lord has, has brought this family back together. Foreshadowing of what He plans to do with this nation, with the entirety of the human race. In fact, And God will teach them both what they must do together. Now, utterly dumbstruck by his encounter with the Lord and, and entirely out of things and ways to object, Moses returns to his, his father-in-law in verse 18 and begs his pardon. He says, I've got to go back to Egypt and see if any of my family is still alive. He doesn't mention his encounter with God, perhaps because still in his heart, He's not sure what to make of all this. Even after this, he still doesn't get it. He's still mumbling under his breath about this, these miracles he's encountered. But Jethro sends him on in peace. And even better than that, God sends him away in courage, assuring him that all those who wanted him dead are dead themselves. And so he saddles his donkeys and camels with his wife and kids and provisions and does the unthinkable. He's Egypt's number one most wanted and he heads back into Egypt. And presumably along the way, the Lord reminds him to do all the miracles that He's shown him so far and so much more. And while there's a chance that Israel might believe, Moses surely doesn't like hearing that Pharaoh himself Will not. We'll get to this later, but we'll read how Pharaoh not only hardens his own heart, but the Lord even works to harden Pharaoh's heart too. Pharaoh will not believe. He'll not obey. But will that stop God? Will this meager Pharaoh and his paltry cavalry of thousands stop the Lord? I think you know the ending of that story. But in addition to all these things that we've seen the name of the Lord mean, what His character is, grace, justice, sovereignty, miracles, healing, deliverance, patience, mercy, salvation, we're also reminded here that He is the Father. A term of endearment. A term of relationship. Of belonging. Of tenderness. The One who loved Israel before they were even formed. He is their Father. And the one who will strike anyone who opposes Him or them, He'll strike them and their sons dead. Because God is serious about His loving commitment to Israel. He's serious about His gracious covenant to humankind. He does not easily abandon thousands of generations. We read. Instead, He wills to rescue them. And in these last five verses of this chapter, we see that what He has intended all along, He accomplishes. Because Moses and Aaron meet. They embrace. They kiss. They cry. And the Lord prepares them. He teaches them and shows them what they must do. And they go to the Israelites and present their plan. They present the Lord. And guess what? Israel believes. One of the few times they seem to do that in Scripture. They believe. And this leads them to fall down and worship and hope, perhaps for the first time in 400 years, that God has heard their cries. He's seen their misery. He's for them. And He's against Pharaoh. Now this is all well and good. And it's a happy ending to a tense chapter. But maybe you notice we skipped over a few difficult verses here. Verses 24 through 26. A passage that one of my seminary professors, my Hebrew professor, said that he wishes was not in the Bible. It's so bizarre, he wishes he could cut it out because it, inter it just interrupts this very smooth 
story, doesn't it? Moses is a jerk. He doesn't listen to God. God is still good. It says, hey, I'm going to reunite you with your family. Israel's going to believe you and we're going to get this thing going. That would have been a nice story. But here in the middle of this, we have this baffling tale. Between Moses leaving Jethro and meeting Aaron, we read the Lord confronts Moses in a campsite one night with the intent to kill. What? Why? What's, what's going on? That's a good question. I'd be lying to you if I said I fully understand what's happening here. There's many interpretations throughout Jewish and Christian history as you can imagine. No one exactly knows what happened in this con- confrontation. The author, presumably Moses himself, is very scant in detail. But what's clear is that something is not right. God doesn't kill indiscriminately. He's a just God. He doesn't get pleasure in harming for no reason. If God seeks this kind of punishment, something is woefully wrong. That's one thing we do know. And what's also clear is that what seems to stop this from happening is the act of circumcision. But what's less clear to us It's kind of surprising to us, maybe. What's less clear is is who's actually being threatened here. And what's also less clear is what Zipporah, Moses' wife, means by her very dramatic statement. See, some think it's Moses that God wants to kill. And maybe. He's been one of the central characters in the story up until this point. But the text is just not clear about that. It could actually be that Moses, or rather that the Lord, was seeking to kill Gershom or one of his other sons. See, Moses' son was not circumcised, it seemed. And and perhaps Moses himself, we don't know, perhaps he wasn't circumcised either. Even though this was something instituted all the way back in Abraham's day. Perhaps both their lives are in danger. And we really don't know what what Zipporah means when she says to Moses after throwing bloody human skin on the ground, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Is she saying that in disgust? She's saying that in disgust that Moses did something that would allow God to come near and strike him or his son dead? Or is she saying it in relief? seeing that circumcision, the shedding of blood, has saved someone's life. That by the shedding of blood, you are my groom again, my husband, you're back with me again. So we, we start to walk away with lots of questions about this. Does God intend to kill Gershom or Moses or one of his other sons? Is Zipporah angry or is she overjoyed? We simply don't know. This is a mystery to us. But as we said at the beginning of the sermon, a mystery in the text of Scripture serves not as a roadblock, as an impediment, but an invitation to meditate deeper on who God is and what He could possibly mean for us and our lives. These three verses should cause us much reflection. And while there's still much that we don't know about this passage or about our own lives even, about our own condition, we don't know why we're sick. We don't know why we ache. We don't know when we'll find comfort or companionship. We don't know when we'll we'll find relief and reconciliation. So often we just find ourselves stumbling and mumbling through life, doubting and disobeying God at every turn, thinking that if only we pursue our own way and our own wisdom, we'll find something better and greater for us. So much of life, even the miraculous parts, even when God shows up so clearly on a Sunday morning, can be gone by the time we're sitting on our couches on Sunday afternoon. We're utterly confounded 
by not only the mystery of the Scriptures, but the mystery of what it is to be alive. But here's what we can know. That although, like Moses, we deserve God's anger, that we are ripe for God's mortifying retribution, what we instead get is a blood that covers over us and our lives, delivering us unto salvation. We think of how this passage gives us just a glimpse of what the Passover is going to be like. When it was the blood of a sacrifice over a door or the blood of a slain firstborn son that would appease God's justice on this world. And when we think of that Passover, I would hope that it would lead us to think about this Passover that we're observing today. Where Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and the only sacrifice for human beings, broke His body and shed His blood on a cross that we may partake in the grace and the forgiveness of God forever. When we spend our life mumbling and doubt and disbelief about God's love and His miracles, We cannot ignore that when we deserved nothing but our own blood shed, it was God Himself in Christ who became a bridegroom of blood for us. And as we draw now to this table with all of our baggage, with all of our sorrow, not better than Moses and his stuttering or Israel being as stiff-necked as it was, may we eat Drink and be merry. For yesterday, we were dead. But now, in Christ, we are alive evermore. And this is the mystery and the miracle of the Gospel for us. Let's pray. Father, help us now in our time of testimony and our confession of creeds, and in our partaking of Your supper table to put away our mumbling disbelief and to trust in Your miraculous love for us, given freely by the blood of Your only Son, Jesus our Lord. For it's in His name we pray all these things. Amen.